Hey, Jeffrey. Yes, Gazina. What is a baker's favorite kind of cat? Favorite kind of cat? Let's see, I'm a baker and I've had cats all my life. What's my favorite kind of cat? I don't know. A purebred. A purebred. And what's a baker's favorite kind of dog? A purebred. No, a chocolate lab. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, I have, wait, hold on. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll be here all day. I have to be here all nice day because we can't you. leave. <laughs> We're not allowed to leave. We're here all the time. Oh, uh, here we are again. We're here. I'm Gazina. I'm Jeffrey. And we're here with the Isolation Baking Show. And we're, today we're going to be making challah. And I'm going to be making a depression era chocolate cake with a fudgy frosting. Are we going to be depressed? No, it's going to make us so happy. Oh, good. We can be depressed later. That's good. And we actually did something for you ahead of time. The challah mix takes quite a while and it's in the mixer. And so it's loud and laborious. We recorded it ahead of time. So after this, we're going to be posting it on the site, on King Arthur's Facebook page, so that you can see what the mix looks like, because I think it's really important to see yeah. the development of the bread. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we're going to start by dividing some of that, correct? Correct. OK. This is the, this is the mix that he made earlier in secret. <laughs> now he's going to divide it. So divide away, Jeff. OK, but first I want to say last week I was so blown away by your crumpet egg sandwich oh. <laughs> that I had to go home and make one and my god was that good yours was better but oh my gosh it was good oh thank you yes yeah. I, I think things like that especially when you need don't need a lot of extra that goes into it and then of course I love anything with eggs and bacon and cheese <laughs> nothing much better so this is the dough that you had already made how this has been resting for it, about not nearly long enough so we're just doing this for demonstration purposes because the dough has only been mixed about 45 minutes and so it's not nearly ripe enough to actually make bread with. But if we had given this a full fermentation, which would be, I would want to give it at least two hours, then we would dump it here. And the best way to divide the dough, and I'm just going to do a few pieces. I'm going to divide a few and then turn them into cylinders. Um, the best way to do that is rather than just going and starting hacking pieces off it, what you'll want to do is cut strips of dough. If I need dough that's, say, 50 grams, the strip might be that wide. If I need dough that's, say, 200 grams, the strip might be that wide. So I'll just divide maybe four pieces, and we'll go 85 grams, which is about three ounces. Now, how, how long would you activity. usually allow it to rest before I would, you divided it? Uh, at, at least two hours, but there's many, many, many ways to make challah. And since my life as a baker has been as a production baker, we've always done it the same way. This goes back to my very first job. Challah is typically eaten, baked and eaten on Friday. And we would mix the dough Thursday and chill it right away. Then at the end of the shift we would take that cold dough divide it and then turn it into cylinders which i'm going to show you the process for that right now and then refrigerate those cylinders covered until the next morning that way a few things happen one a lot of flavor develops even though the dough has been cold overnight the whole time it's still even in the cold environment flavor develops secondly in Friday morning, which is a very busy morning in a bakery, you've already got strands ready to roll out. Mm -hmm. So it just speeds up the whole process. And that's how I still make it. But if you're just doing a small batch, you'll probably find it's easier to simply ferment it for two hours. Maybe you'll give it a fold after one hour and then divide your strands, make your braids, proof them and bake them. So once you've got these random shapes, it would be very hard to turn this into a braid right now. So I'm going to just flatten it and then tight little rolling it up like this. When I get to the bottom, I use my thumbs and just roll it into a cylinder. And I've got from dough that I mixed yesterday at my home, I've already got a whole bunch of cylinders that are 
refrigerated that I will be turning into braids after we see that very non-depressing depression cake that you're about to make. <laughs> Chocolate okay. is never depressing. Now, as far as cylinders are concerned, I have noticed that you know a lot of people have trouble with what they call, it looks like stretch marks on the dough. And is that because it hasn't been fully developed enough? Um, it could be that. It could also be, do you mean r little ripped marks? Yeah, it l literally, it doesn't look like a smooth, it should right. be smooth and shiny and almost look like you can see your face in it. But oftentimes you'll see almost ridges and stretch marks in that, to me, it's a sign of it's, it's not developed enough. It it's that it's a rough well dough. It could also be that um, the, it's being worked too aggressively. Ah, yeah. Right. If you yeah. see that it's ripping, and the, there's no rips on this, but if we're ripping, that would be an indication that I'm being a little bit too forceful on yeah. it. Yeah. So you have to back off. You do want these to be tight so that you don't have a bunch of air pockets internally, um, but you don't want to see rips on the surface, but yeah. as tight as you can without a rip. Sometimes it's beneficial to overdo it, then you'll know I have to back off. Right. So if I were so forceful that I ripped it, then I can say, oh good, I'm so glad I ripped it. Now I know that's a little too much force. Back off just yeah. a bit. Okay, so that's that. And now cake time, right? Cake time, yeah. So after we do the cake, do not worry, there's more to come with the hala. Jeffrey's already divided and rested quite a few strands to do from one one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. And a special creature? Oh, yeah. A, a special mystical creature. creature? We have a mystical creature from Hala for you. But I'm going to be making cake first. And the reason the timing works really well is that this is an incredibly fast moving cake and that it's all in one bowl. And I call this crazy cake or depression era cake. And it was developed by the, the most clever of people women who had to really budget themselves and make do with ingredients that were at hand. So I kind of feel that we're in that situation right now. I felt this was an apt recipe to be making. But first I wanted to show you the type of cocoa we're using. We're using a Dutch processed cocoa. And that means that they have taken the acidity out of the cocoa and made it neutral, right? And so this is like, you know, a bang on, it's about 8%, so it has a it's a little alkaline. And the one next to it is called a black cocoa. It's closer, so this is like maybe 7, and that is what water is, which is neutral. You mean pH 7. pH 7, yeah. yes, mm -hmm. sorry. And this is about an 8. So this is actually it has a little bit of alkalinity to it, this one. And that's a black cocoa. But I'm using the one that is neutral, like water. And that means if you have a very acidic cocoa, it has... a I would say a very a bit of a, an acidic forward taste. It doesn't taste as chocolatey to me mm. either. Um, but that acid also lends something that is helpful that if you're gonna be using baking soda, it helps with the leavening. So you mm -hmm. do need an add an acid for this. The one thing, so this is, al this is neutral alkaline, and then there's baking soda that goes into this as well. Mm -hmm. One teaspoon of baking soda along with some salt that I'm putting in now. And I'm sifting it because I find that cocoa can be very clumpy and I want it to be smooth. I'm getting those clumps out. And one of the lovely things about having a relatively alkaline environment like we're going to have is that it helps strengthen the gluten bonds mm -hmm. because we don't have any eggs in this. And we're losing all that protein that would mm. otherwise bind things, mm. which I think is, it is just so clever. I, you have these women who were doing the best that they could with the ingredients that they mm -hmm. had, and they were creating this very sophisticated structure that held together in the oven without the usual ingredients, which makes my yeah. heart sing. It's just so fantastic. So it strengthens, strengthens the gluten, but we also have, you're thinking, well, if it's alkaline, that means there's baking soda in here. Usually would you be using baking powder? Mm-hmm because that would allow the baking soda to actually have any efficacy. But there's also vinegar in this. So we have some acidity that's gonna happen here. And, and so how did these women know Gazina? Was it uh, trial and error? It doesn't seem like they were all trained scientists who knew about all these deep characteristics of foods. Uh, I think they were just closer to the, the, the food chemistry naturally. Naturally. And that they were doing a lot of things without recipes. And yeah. they, were, they had a much more uh, almost like hands-on approach to how they were doing things. So I think there's also 
a memory of how things worked and a memory probably of other times when they had to make do without ingredients mm -hmm. and expensive things like it's hard to find eggs right now I know it's very hard to find flour um, and on that this is actually a good you can swap out gluten-free flours for this as well oh, this holds together very wow. well because it's very moisture rich things that have tend to be moisture rich you don't get that grainy consistency mm -hmm. that often comes with that gluten-free flour so in here I have a cup of coffee. I have that acid I promised you, which is a tablespoon of vinegar. I used apple cider vinegar because I like it. A third cup of oil, and then a little bit of vanilla. So if anybody's paying attention and vegan, you will know that what I'm making now is a vegan cake. I do not think in the depression era, that's what they were going for. Right. It is just because they did not have those lovely dairy products mm -hmm. and those eggs that it just tends to align with vegan baking today. And where did you learn this, Kate? I, because I was so curious, I had depression era family who didn't. So both my Omi and my nanny in Alabama had to make do with what they had. Yeah. And my nanny specifically had seven kids and was raising them by herself. So she made things like this, she made fudge, I'm making mm. a fudge frosting, and she did candy work and sugar work, and she was one of those women who knew just by looking at the sugar boiling exactly yeah. the temperature. Yeah. And that's, ah, that makes me so... The thickness in, of the bubbles, The right? thickness of the bubbles yeah. and the glossiness and the slowness. She knew exactly whether mm. it was hard crack, mm. soft crack, brilliant. I did this really quickly because the baking soda starts becoming active the second you add the liquid. And I'm going to pour it in here, which is a nine inch pan. And I put some parchment on the bottom with a little bit of, I buttered the bottom, but I don't butter the sides because I usually release my cakes with a paring knife so that the cake that I baked is nine inches rather than eight and three quarters from shrinking away from the sides. And it of doesn't the pan. look like it's more than half full in the pan so if someone only had no. an eight inch cake could they they could make it yes and, yeah. and the baking time it's at 350 for about 30 to 35 minutes and i also tend to bake and this cake doesn't necessarily need it but if i want a totally flat non-domed cake if yep. i don't want it to dome yep. i will put some paper towels moist or some uh kitchen towels and put them around my cake and then cover that with tin foil yeah because that so slows that the rise? It slows yeah. the rise, so yeah. it's a more even rise, because uh. what will happen is that it will dome because it rises on the side, because the heat hits it right away, it sets, but the middle keeps mm -hmm. doming. Mm -hmm. Since we're not doing a layer cake, we can, I can stand a dome. Right. But for a layer cake, I love it when I don't have to lose yeah. the dome. But as you were saying earlier, you don't lose anything because you just dry that out and use it as bread. I will crumbs. still use it for yeah. breadcrumbs mm -hmm. or for all, like putting on the sides of a cake. Sure, sure. All those things, all, or just a snack. <laughs> snack is good. So this is going to go into the oven for about 30 to 35 minutes. There we go. And then if, so you can buy cake strips commercially. They do work. Sometimes they work too well because they're so insulated, they can make cakes a little gummy. So that's why I like to do this. Just make sure that the tin foil actually covers, I'm using paper towels today, covers them because I do not want you to start a fire in your oven. I'm not saying that I ever have. I started a fire in my oven yesterday. I was so scared. Not with this, in a totally different way. I almost burnt down my house yesterday. I'm feeling shame from it. I'm not going to tell you how I did it. It was ridiculous, but it was not this way. Ray knows how. Um, but if you want your cakes not to dome, and that means when they get higher in the middle, great way to do it. So it's not unlike if you make a cheesecake and you put it in a bain marie, that water bath. What it does is it slows down and it evens out, get, hand that to me, the bake. So you don't get that cracking and you get an even bake throughout the cake. Same theory, not as harsh, because if you did that with a cake, it would make it incredibly gummy. So that's my little trick for a non-dome cake. I think Jeffrey has assembled all of his, that's a lot of cylinders there. That's very exciting.
Are they all accounted for? Yep. None of them left. They're not allowed to leave anyway, Jesse. They're on, they're on the stay home ruling. That's right. Oh, you're in the oven. I'm in the oven. You're, we're, I'm, we're waiting on you All to right, start showing us your braids. gorgeous braids. So what do we need for braids? We're going to need a weight. At some point, we're going to need an egg. Do you need a pastry brush? I have a pastry brush, and I have egg wash, which we'll need. And as we mentioned in passing earlier, we'll be making braids with one strand, two strand, three strand, four, five, and six. First thing that one might ask is why bother braiding? You know, why go to the effort of doing it? Why not just take a chunk of dough and put it in a loaf pan and proof it and bake it? And I think because we're human, you know, one of our best characteristics is that if something's good, we want to make it better. If something is pleasing to look at, we want to make it beautiful to look at. And Braiding can give you that really wonderful sense of just creating a nice shape. And there are dozens and dozens and dozens of different shapes that you can make. Um, the most I've ever used was 72 strands of dough. That's very hard because some of the strands were five feet long and they had yeast in them. So you have to be pretty quick. Um, but Wait, how many did you just say? 72. It was a big oval oh, okay. platter. <laughs> So, was this for a wedding? Uh, no, just for. I used to always keep some. Um, for a troll under a bridge my... who needed a crown? <laughs> what, what, what for, Jeffrey? What for? Because I had always a display window in my bakery. Oh, that that's you could see fabulous. From the sidewalk so that people would walk by and see different shapes and this and that. I love that. That's so mm. very European of you. All right. So I'm going to work on this side so that Ray is filming from over my shoulder so that people will see a more or less baker's eye view of what's going on. And I'm going to start with a couple of rolls, two types of rolls, each with one strand of dough. So notice how I'm working two at a time. Obviously, you don't have to. And these are going to have a, just a very, very slight taper. And it's simply a matter of going under here, coming up here, taking this one around the back. Here's the shape. And I'm going to kind of smear it together underneath so that it doesn't come apart. I'll do that one one more time. And if anyone's worried, this is going to live on so you can keep going back and watching Jeffrey make his beautiful rolls and braids. OK, so get it like that and then just smear it under there. So there's one way to do a one strand roll. A second one would be the same start. This will be longer because it's just slightly more elaborate. And I'm going to kind of make the letter the number six. And then I take this long end and I come up one time, two times, that's not good. I got to undo this, make it a little bit longer. How long do you, are you trying to get it approximately? 17 inches. One, two, and the third time you leave the nub sticking up. This is flatter than the first one, and so it's very nice for a sandwich. One thing that's common to all braids is that you know, there's a lot of things common to all braids. Anyway, I did that one too quickly. So anyway, I went through three times and keep that nub up. It's very cute. But again, you can, re you can re watch this. These things will live. Somebody has asked, Jeffrey, what does your t-shirt say? Pardon me? What does your t-shirt say? Someone has asked. What Some, do you, my t-shirt? What does your t-shirt say? This is, um, it says tradition. Um, I've taught several classes in Russia, in St. Petersburg, and the nice. first class I taught, there was a woman who came to class who has become a very dear friend. She lives in Tula, mm -hmm. which is three hours south of Moscow, and I visited her twice. Yeah. Um, she brought me on a tour of Tolstoy's estate, which was magic. Pretty cool. Which is in Tula. And last time I was there, which was in October, 
I spent three days with her, and I didn't teach her a damn thing. She taught me Russian <laughs> classics, Russian honey cakes, and oh, fantastic. traditional breads, and all kinds of wonderful And that t-shirt is from her bakery? It's from her bakery. Yep. Nice. It's a really sweet little bakery. She's quite skilled. All right, that was a, that's some one-strand rolls. Now I'll do a two-strand. Oh, someone asked a very good question. Matthew asked, when you have to undo the strand like you did, yeah. is there anything that will help to keep the dough from sticking so you can undo it? Is it yeah. just the nature of the what, dough itself? What you'll want to do is, again, we want our strands to be nice and distinct. And I wasn't too concerned with these because it is just one strand. But all the rest of the, the strands that I roll, I'm going to also roll them in a little bit of flour. Mm -hmm. That's going to help them stay right. distinct. Yeah. So I started saying there's one thing that is common when you're doing braiding. You'll want to, A, have your strands as much as possible the same length and the same taper. They always have shrink, so you'll you know, overroll it. The because other thing, too, people often, they don't pre-shape, so their cylinders aren't as gorgeous as yours and that pre-shaping really makes a difference oh yeah yeah it makes a huge difference right yeah so for the two strand and that, let me stress one thing and that is that i'm not going to do these really slow because we won't have time for all of our stuff today right. um, i'm not going to do them at production speed but i'm going to do them fairly fast just to get through them all so it might be a good idea to if you're interested in a certain type of braid that I'm making, you might want to just note how long into the program it's been. Yeah, and then absolutely. you can go back and watch it. Yeah. Right? So for this one, this is really sweet. It's shaped like a teardrop. That was so <laughs> now, need slow mo. See that? Isn't that cute? That is beautiful. So things to look for on every braid that you make, things to strive for. These lines should all be parallel. These lines should all be parallel, right? You don't want to braid too tightly because if you do, whoops, don't fall, egg. If you do, then as the bread expands, as it proofs, uh, it might start getting distorted. Mm -hmm. So I'm that was two go, strands. That was two. I'm going to do a four strand now because that's what's on this tray. So that was a, another tip. Start with the dog bone shape first. Thank you for saying <laughs> that. That's right. That's yeah, right. Yeah, and then. That's, that's important. And See all the of your strands. Back? Yeah, so that's why I'm kind of over rolling it. But you're, you're over rolling them each to an equal over roll so that they shrink back equally. Right. But then after I do all four or whatever the number is, then I verify that they're of the same length and correct any ones that need correcting. Like this one. This, this guy needs just another stroke or two, right? And again, this is a small detail, but it's helpful because again, if you have just that little sheen of flour on there, it tends to allow the strands to remain separate. If you can, Jeffrey, do this a little more slowly. Okay. Sound effects are optional, but they are helpful. They are always helpful. So you see one goes up, and then I pick up the one adjacent to it, bring that up, pick up the one adjacent. And well, that you, little weight at the end was genius. Well, you'll want to have something. Yeah. Yeah. So that's just some jam. What's in there? It was a gift. It's strawberry, raspberry, chocolate, balsamic vinegar jam. Do they know that you're just using it as a weight and not actually eating it? <laughs> they will now. <laughs> it's it's multi-purpose. It is multi-purpose. Okay. So that was a four strand. That's four. Every time you're done, look it over, manipulate it. That's a word with a bad rap, but it comes from the Greek manipulate. It means manos, hands. It just yeah. means handling it. And so you, so you want to just work it so that it's symmetrical, right? And once again, try to have nice parallel lines everywhere. Gorgeous. Okay, and now, okay, now we'll do that Greek snake. Let's 
see here. Oh, this is the mythical creature that I promised you. Do you have it? Yeah. Oh, this is the cutest thing ever. Okay. <laughs> it's a Greek good luck Easter snake. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and how do we do that? Let's I'll do show it. You. Okay, we're making a mythical creature now. Just in time for Greek Easter. This will have a pretty strong taper to it. Am I just seeing it from my angle that one side is more tapered than the other? Okay, there you go. Right. It's like, it's like a Harry the, Potter wand. This will be the, the head. So now we simply open up the mouth. I think the egg is a symbol of eternity, right? Yes. Well, and, and are snakes like fertility? Or what, what's the symbolism of snakes? I, think, I don't know, but I know that the, the egg is also fertility. Yeah. But also the, the red uh, Greek Easter eggs are just so gorgeous. Now, is that egg hard-boiled already nope. or no? It's a raw it's egg. It's a raw egg, so it will cook when it bakes. Yep. Nice. Okay. Shove it in there. Vasilia just said, my aunt from the island of Crete used to make huge snakes with an egg in its mouth. Who did that? Somebody from Crete? From Crete. Yeah. He's just so her up. aunt from Crete did no it. Kidding. She grew up with it. Yeah. All right. And then coil it up. This is egg wash from your chickens. The color is. I know. It's bright it's orange. Electric, isn't it? A little bit of egg wash. Egg wash does two things. One, it gives things a shine. The other thing it does is acts as glue and in this case our objective is glue so that we can glue the eye on these are currants i'll get two that are the same size more or less it also at this point looks a little like a susian wind wind instrument okay <laughs> hey that's just me so that's a little bit of dough in a round. And there's a couple of eyeballs. And it will stay, the eyeballs will stick because of because the egg wash. Because we're gonna wait until that is tacky to the touch, which it is. We'll put them there. And then when it's risen, what'll happen is we will egg wash it. Oh, the, one of the eyes fell out. And then I'll start here and I'll cut a fairly big cut. You can see that I went pretty deeply for the most part. A pretty deep cut and then to the sides, back but to the But that's not center. until a full proof. That's not until a full proof. And that's before right. the bake. That's right. Okay. So that's one, two, and four, right? One, two, four, and mythical snake. Right. Okay. And then now we have to do three. Now we're we going to do miss three. three. And we're going to try to slow Jeffrey down. Oh, three. Jeffrey. Everybody knows how to do three. Well, a braid. You'd be surprised how many people don't know how to braid. Oh. Like a, do like a, a okay. traditional hair okay. braid. Okay. <laughs> I promise it's true. Ray, Ray actually does know how to do a braid. All right. So I'm going to make two. I'm actually going to make four three-strand braids. Oh, nice. Because I want to make double deckers. Because I think they're really, really... Pretty. Here, give me that to me. So let's get this out of the way. <clears throat> the hollow recipe? We'll do the if you're looking for the hollow recipe, the link to the recipe is actually in the description of the show so that you can see the full description and the mix of the actual dough is going to be a separate video. So you didn't miss anything as far as making of the dough. It just takes a while. We thought it'd be a really efficient way to have a separate video for you that we will post once this is over. Let me stress that when you're making braids, 
I mean, I guess it doesn't matter if you're just making two, but if you're in any kind of a production environment, you really want to use your body carefully. And the best way to do that is to let your shoulders do the bulk of the work, right? So if you'll notice, my shoulders are right above the work, so that mm -hmm. my upper back is really doing it. It's not, yep. if you're just doing it with your wrists, you're going to wear yourself out pretty quick. I say the same with rolling. Yeah, yeah. That it's, you use your, you put the weight of your body into it. So the question is, and it's a good one, per the recipe that we posted, approximately, approximately how many things could you make from that one recipe? What did we post? The 1.7 kilos? Correct. The, the smaller of the two. Well, let's go back and you can do the figuring on it. The, the one strand rolls are 85 grams. Uh -huh. The two strand teardrop braid was 220 grams. Mm -hmm. The these strands are 170 each. These are going to be a top knot, which are going to be 85 grams each. Mm -hmm. So you can fi you figure if you want a braid that weighs about a pound or 450 grams, you'll want to have about 18 ounces of dough or 500 grams to start mm -hmm. with, and then you'll wind up with a decent sized loaf. I got two very long six strand loaves from uh -huh. that one batch. So if you want, and Just they were, two? well, they were very long. Yeah. They, yeah. I did them on a full sheet pan. Uh -huh. So you could uh, potentially then get four yeah. uh, six strand loaves from just that one recipe based on what I did. Get in there, Ray. Okay. I'll show you the easiest way to make a three strand. You start in the middle. You braid down towards you. Notice how I'm leaving a little bit of air space between the strands. That's so it has plenty of room to proof. And now I'm going to pick it up and flip it like that. And then I just continue. OK. Make sure the ends are nice and seamed. And then this one, I'm actually going to do you want a full sheet pan? Oh, you're going to make a little... I'm going to make a nice curved one. I love oh, the wreath. shape. All right. And that's going to get another braid on top in a moment. But first I'm going to do the other big one. Gazina, could I ask you to grab that other sheet pan that's there, the empty one? Yeah. Thanks. And this is again three strands. Yep. And that's a decent amount of pressure that you're putting a down. A decent amount. Again, I'm listening to the dough with my hands because the dough obviously would rip if I was too, too strong on it. Um, but the dough will tell you exactly what it can handle and what it can't handle. All right. Well, I think also what you said in using your back and shoulders actually evens out the pressure rather than using your hands because your fingers tend to separate and if you put too much pressure just with your hands it's very easy to rip the dough. That's right. Okay. So exactly what you did before. Okay now this is a good thing to see. It's sort of the weakest link theory. So now I've run out, right? So I obviously I'll have a really asymmetrical braid if I keep trying to finish this with these longer bits. So I'm going to take those off, finish the braid, and what I do, mostly out of respect for the dough and the fact that I'm using, you know, ingredients that are edible and nutritious, instead of throwing this out, I do that. And certainly if yeah. you're in a production setting where you're selling products by the weight, then yeah. you don't want to um, waste that bit of dough. What's the temperature of this dough that you're working with now? Cold. It's cold. Yeah. Good. 
Otherwise, it wouldn't be so easy to manipulate. Yeah, and did we talk about that in the uh, the when we were mixing the dough? Did I talk about having it mixed and cold, or at some point? Yeah. Did, so in the mixing video, started, there yeah. is talk about the mix and getting it cold, uh, but. Any dough that you have to manipulate like this, whether it's a dry or a wet dough, is better handled when it is very cool. Yes, that's the key. So this was, we pretty much took this out of the refrigerator right, right. before you started mm -hmm. braiding. That's right. Okay, now I'm gonna egg wash just the tops. And again, the function of this egg wash is glue before it goes in the oven, it'll get egg washed for shine. Okay. How's How many? It's, get, it's, it's domed, it's got a few more minutes. I gave it a poke. It told me no. Yeah. One thing I'll also point out, and that is that it's very easy to see me doing this, but I'm really doing this as well. Yes. You've got to be extending your hands so that you're actually rolling it out. And another thing is, if it takes you three times longer to roll it out, there's a risk that you also um, warm it up and it can yes. get all bubbly. Yes, the more you work which it. Which is another reason why it's really good to work with cold dough. Mm -hmm. If you like braiding, there's, I'm sure, I haven't looked personally because I learned braiding before the internet era, yeah. um, but I'm sure there are many sources online to see different braiding patterns. But this video will live on, in infamy maybe, um, <laughs> and so that if you want to refer back to it, it's always going to be there for you. We're not just live, we are there for you. But even beyond what I'm doing today, there's yeah. just innumerable types of braids. So this is another? This is going to be now a little top braid. Let's see, that one's not long enough. So once a traditional hala is six braided pieces, we're going to be making six braids. Well, but. it would be wrong to say that that's a tr I mean, there's many, many, many traditional braids. Six is very common. It's common, yeah. Tradition is also based on region, family. Yeah. So someone said, I use butter so the dough is stiff from the refrigerator. Should I warm it up a bit e to make it easier to shape? Um, that's a really good question. I mean, typically hala wouldn't have butter because it's eaten on the Jewish Sabbath and you right. can't have, have it with butter. Yeah. Um, but if, if I would pull it out of the refrigerator and see how it reacts to trying to shape it. Yeah. The problem is if you warm it up, you're going to start by warming the outside. Right. The inside will remain cold, mm -hmm. and it could make it pretty challenging if you've got these different temperature zones. Yeah. All right. So someone at Matthew asked, do you care for saffron in dough, and do you have a preference between sugar and honey? Um, I've never put saffron in dough. It sounds r really exotic, it's doesn't it? It's, it's, it, it's, it's lovely. It sounds lovely. And if you had a preference, sugar or honey? Um, is funny thing, since I've been a beekeeper since 1982, that my preference in hala is for, for sugar, but um, honey would be fine. Keep in mind that honey is about 17% moisture. Yeah, so you mecked so, it. Yeah. yeah, you might need to account for that because in other words, it would probably be a little less sweet than the sugar. It's also application whatever you're making. 
Sometimes honey's better, sometimes sugar's better. Yeah. Sometimes maple's better. Sometimes maple's better. Okay, so the egg wash has become tacky. So now I'll take and lay this around and make a little double decker. Okay, these can be really nice and celebratory. I'll check it once or twice during the proofing to make sure that it's not sliding off. If I had egg washed it and not let it get tacky, if it was still fluid, then almost definitely the top braid would fall off. Yeah. So you do have to be pretty careful about that. Okay. So there was a question, how far away is Hala from brioche? Um, well, brioche is 100% butter. Yes. Um, you can't call Hala Hala if you're using butter. In a technical sense, it's not hala, but brioche is going to be richer because it's got butter, not oil. But both enriched. In both are ways. enriched. Both yep. are enriched doughs. They're not um, lean doughs. No, they are certainly not lean. Um, often you'll see milk and brioche, mm -hmm. which you wouldn't see in hala for the same reason. For the there same can't reason. Be dairy in it. All right, so there's what we've got so far. Now we've got one more tray with braids. And that's going to be a five and a six. How long till your cake's out? Now. <laughs> Thank you, Jeffrey. So you can see the dome. I do. That's done, huh? That's done. Wow. I always look for the poke back as long as it springs back. Some people stab yeah. their cakes. And I think that's a terrible thing to do to a cake. And also, it is usually not terribly accurate. Yeah. Because they'll say if a moist crumb or clean, and sometimes a moist crumb, it still needs five more minutes. And those cakes tend to cave right in the middle, just a little. And that's because it needed about five more minutes. And those moist crumbs were a big fat liar. But if you poke and it springs right back and doesn't leave an indentation, it's done if you poke it like that. And it feels firm, but it doesn't spring back, five minutes. And then it's good. And so for some foam cakes, I'll, I'll also listen to the cake mm. to see if, the, if it hasn't set, if the proteins mm. haven't set. You can mm. hear it cr crackle loudly and it's mm. protesting. It wants to be back in. So 10 minutes, This I won't release it yet because it's too tender and fragile. So I'll let this sit for 10 minutes and then I will get it out of its pan to cool. Back to the braids? Back to the braids. Okay, two more. Five and six. I think this is my favorite one of all the different braids. Another thing that's interesting about braids is that most, not all, of them have a certain minimum number of strands to make them. Mm -hmm. But after you've got that, you can keep doing more. Right. So a three strand is just a three strand, but yeah. and a two strand is just a two. But the four that I did, you can do that with more than four strands. This five strand that I'm about to do, you can do five, six, seven, eight, nine, 89. Well, so the, the pattern is what's key. Yeah, that's right. And then yeah. I often, th whenever I do patterns like this, uh, I, I often tell myself not to think so much because hmm. that's when I get lost. <laughs> and that's why I got nervous when you said slow down. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, that's exactly it. It's muscle memory, you don't want to mess that up. Yeah, that's right. So someone, uh, Andrea asked, sometimes when I make hala or brioche, the dough remains sticky and I'm, af I'm afraid to add too much flour. Um, when I did add a bunch of flour uh, and continued mixing, it remained so sticky it didn't come together. Is that just a matter of mixing time? That they sh sh It's just about allowing it to mix and not worry that in the beginning it's so sticky? Or was the formula off? Uh, could, could be the formula. Yeah. Hala shouldn't really be that sticky. Right. You know, one of my fond memories from all the years I worked at the King Arthur Bakery, we made hala on Fridays. 
and um, one day we were making four strand hollows and one day you just triggered this memory because you talked about um, muscle memory yeah or whatever one day I said all right I'm gonna make all the strands with my eyes closed and and the only thing I allowed myself to do was after I had we four on a sheet pin I was allowed to open my eyes to put it on the <laughs> rack but then <laughs> Walking, on, walking sometimes does require a bit of eyesight. Boy, was that fun. They weren't perfect by any means, but it, it was really fun. The bakers were looking at me. I mean, anytime I opened my eyes and I'd see them looking at they me, they were staring. They were bemused, to say the least. Okay, here's a five. It's unique for two reasons. One reason is it always starts with two strands on one side and all the rest on the other. So if we were doing, say, a 10 strand, we'd have two over here and eight over here. That's one reason it's unique. The other reason it's unique is because when it's done... Oh, slow. If you can, slower. What? <laughs> okay. Cross these two. The one on the left goes on top of the one on the bottom. On the one on the left goes above the one on the right, and then this one twists over. So cross, cross, twist, cross, cross, twist, cross, cross, twist, and then we'll finish it off. So the one reason it's unique is because it's two and then all the rest. The other reason it's unique is because after you've braided it, it's not quite done. It's done when you flip it up. Ah! It's a spiral. That's lovely. I think this one is the bomb. That is gorgeous. Isn't that pretty? That is so special. Yeah. Yeah. You're kind of good at this, Jeffrey. I love braiding. My first boss, this German woman in Massachusetts, she knew I was interested in this stuff, so she would bring in these old German braiding manuals, and oh. she would translate. She'd say, fourth strand up. <laughs> First strand over, six strand down, <laughs> and I would follow uh, along and follow that's along. That's fabulous. Yeah, it was pretty fun. And then I decided, you know, th and th thanks to her, I was making these big projects like cornucopias and things yeah. for her window. And then I decided yeast can be a little bit unforgiving, so why don't I learn how to braid something that doesn't have yeast in it. So I started um, making baskets. Yes, and that's one of the things that many people don't understand when they see display breads. Oftentimes they don't have yeast in them. Yeah, that's right. Because they, they behave. They're not edible, really. Yeah. Unless you want to break your teeth. But they keep their shape. They bake just as you shape them. Um, so don't think you're doing something wrong if that decorative braid or fancy bread in the shop window doesn't look like the one you made at home. So this is six strands. Yep, last one. And again, if you're just joining us, we went through some gorgeous braids. The recipe is in the description, and this video will live on after we're done being live, so you can refer back to all the magic. Okay. So the six starts with three on each side. And this might be what the earlier questioner was referring to as the traditional one. Yes. You'll see this often. It's really the same pattern as the four. It's just got a couple extra strands. So you have one up, the one next to it becomes the next one up, and the one that was up goes to the inside. Right? It's very important to swing your hips when you do this. And then once again, just finish it off 
with as much symmetry as you can. That's about it. There. So these proof for roughly an hour and a half probably after which egg wash them carefully because if there's bits that aren't washed then it really just draws the eye to it after the bake so egg wash it and then if you like sesame seeds poppy seeds what have you I also find that if it's not properly proofed sometimes that there's an extreme oven spring so even if you did egg wash properly there's yeah. a lot of um, unwanted exposure yeah exactly so that's the patience part of it right is that know your bread be patient as far as the egg wash I use five parts egg one part water and you sieve he sieves yeah, his egg wash. Sieves the egg wash for sure because then it'll be nice and fluid and homogenous instead of having bits of the albumin. Yes. Well, exactly. you know what happens when you when you start egg washing, it all looks gorgeous and all of a sudden it goes bleh. Yeah. So the other thing when I have to do a large batch of egg wash, I don't sieve, I use an immersion blender. Oh, sure. Yes. And that, mm -hmm. especially for large batches, trying mm -hmm. to get that through a sieve is not easy. I am making fudge frosting. Oh, right. So what I started with was, and this is, I am having the recipe based on what you see there in the description because I'm only doing one layer. And I started by melting the butter, then I added my cocoa and some yogurt. And now I'm going to add, on a lower heat, this is two cups of confectioner sugar that I sieved to make the incorporation easier. Uh, the recipe itself calls for four cups, so if you're doing a layer cake. And now you're going to stir this together until it's homogenous and pourable. And so I did start with the, that butter until it was completely melted. Then when I added the cocoa, I also added a little salt to mine. You add the yogurt and the cocoa and then you, on medium heat, and then you allow it to get boily. So I boiled it for a little bit, not so much that it burnt. And then I turned down the heat and I added that confectioner sugar that I did. You don't have to sieve it, but I feel like it comes together so much more quickly when it's less lumpy. So I find that cocoa and look at that. Now it's fudgy. That looks like fudge to me. So cocoa and confectioner sugar are both so lumpy that sometimes it's just easier to sieve them. And I wanted you to see the difference. I don't know if you can tell from here. This is the one that I had just baked off and it's cooling. So the dome is upside down, but you can tell that there is a dome because this part of the cake is levitating a bit. And then it, you've got a little gap there space. So you can tell that it did rise in the middle. This cake that I'm going to coat now, I used a cake strip. So you can see how it's nice and flat on top. So that's what that lovely cake strip does. And now I'm going to start pouring from the middle and allow it to naturally cascade. And I have this on a cooling rack with parchment underneath on a sheet pan to catch, ooh, hey there, confectioners, to catch any errant fudge frosting because, you know, in case you want to eat some after, you don't want to waste it. But this does set relatively quickly. You don't want to mar it too much. So I, I make sure that it spreads evenly and it goes down the sides. And then when it cools, it gets that lovely fudge sheen. It's not shiny like a glaze, but it does have that sheen that you know when you cut into it, it's gonna crackle mm. just ever so slightly. But so you you're wanna not be... masking the sides, you're just letting it drip? I'm just gonna let it drip. Uh -huh. uh, and I have an offset just in case I do want to feel persnickety about it. But you've got to do this right. You can see right here where it's already starting to set. Yeah. Where there's a little skin to it yeah. up top. So that's why you want to work quickly. See? You can see that skin coming over to the side. That's kind of like the Zacha Torte. Yeah, well, that's intentionally a little grainy. The yep, it is. is right? I call it German. I call it Austrian fudge. Hmm. Because that's essentially a, a fudge like consistency. Mm -hmm. So, Depression era chocolate cake. 
Hala in all its glorious forms, including a mythical snake for Greek Easter. Did you, we, we both chose things that began with a CH, and we didn't do that intentionally. No, we did I didn't. kind of like that we did that. Hmm. But now we have cake to eat. We had a wonderful hour with all of you. And next week, we have yeah. a plan. What are you going to make, Jeffrey? Next week, we're going to make a grain bread. It'll be nice and hearty and nice and chewy and nice and nutritious. Uh, it won't be a sourdough bread. I had comments from many different areas last week about sourdough, and some people were really glad. Some people felt like it was too premature for people yeah. just getting into baking. So next week, we'll make a bread. It'll be yeasted. It'll have a pre-ferment in it. Uh, it's a five grain bread and later down the pike we might make a really another good hearty seeded sourdough bread but we'll stay stay away from the sourdough for a little bit longer and right? can you hear that ch there's a chicken laying right now can you hear that that's that chicken gave up its egg for that snake how about that and then i will be making mandelhörnchen which are little almond horns that I grew up with. And so today we made something that was vegan mm -hmm. uh, on its own, not intentionally, uh, that can be turned into something gluten-free. And uh, you can make Mandelhörnchen really easily gluten-free as well. What would you use in place of whites? Uh, no, well, I would make it gluten-free, not vegan. Oh, okay, okay. Yes. Gluten-free, not vegan. Yeah. Not vegan. Yeah. Yeah. I could not give up those whites. No. no, you couldn't. And it was also one of my mother's favorite treats so it, it brings back great memories, and uh, it's super delicious. And it freezes really well, mm -hmm. too. And the challah had three yolks in it that we right. mixed. And the whites are now in the refrigerator, and you're going to use them next week. I'm going to use them next week? I have yeah. a plan for all these ingredients. So thank you so much for spending the hour with us. Great to see you again. Stay, great to see you. Stay safe. We're here for you as long as you need us so that you can bake at home together but apart. So see you next week and enjoy some baking. Bye. Bye.